Jane Philpott never got the chance to defend herself to the full Liberal caucus before the Prime Minister punted her from the party on Tuesday. This over shared concerns with former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould that inappropriate pressure was applied by the Prime Minister, his staff and others to give SNC-Lavalin an escape from prosecution. Avoiding a criminal conviction was the key to continued contracts from the federal government. Well, to discuss her reactions as this controversy unfolded to this week's stunning caucus eviction, I'm joined in the studio by Jane Philpott. Thanks for coming in, appreciate this. Uh, was it really a huge surprise that you and Jody Wilson-Raybould were punted from cabinet? This is all first and foremost a loyalty test to be in that caucus. You're perceived as being disloyal. Well, I must say I was surprised to be expelled from caucus on Tuesday. As you know, I was forced to step down as a cabinet minister based on my obligations around cabinet solidarity, based on the fact that I couldn't support the way that the government was managing the SNC-Lavalin case. And uh, I had to be able to speak of one, with one mind with the rest of the government, and not being able to do that forced me to resign from cabinet. However, as a member of parliament, uh, members of parliament are in fact uh, have an obligation to represent their constituents, to hold the government to account, even if they happen to be of the same party. Um, of course, I agreed and have always supported the, the, the broad strokes of uh, the liberal platform and the important policy work that we're doing. But there was this one issue that I didn't agree with. And I thought that uh, one could continue in caucus and say, this is an area where I'd like to continue to see an alternate path. Um, I didn't have an opportunity even to say that uh, in front of my National Caucus colleagues. Uh, the decision was made. So when the Prime Minister hauled you in his office and told you, what, was, what went through your mind? What was your reaction? Well, you know, the entire circumstance of this whole story is, is regrettable and obviously was completely preventable if, if in the first place, uh, politicians and staff members and officials hadn't, uh, as the evidence reveals, mm. attempted to interfere in this criminal trial. That would have been the first place to right. have prevented it. But I think there are other places along the way uh, where we could have prevented the circumstances that have taken place. What so, would, it, what would have stopped it? Well, uh, I think some have proposed that if the shuffle hadn't taken place, that uh, things might have you know, continued as they were. Um, I have proposed that once the story came out in the public, uh, that there may have been an opportunity to say, now that that evidence is more clear and we understand that in fact, whether it was planned or organized or not, the evidence reveals that this pressure did take place, mm -hmm. there would have been opportunities to say, oh my goodness, this happened, we are sorry, it was wrong to do this, um, apologize to Canadians, get to the bottom of how it happened, mm -hmm. and commit to making sure it doesn't happen again. And that story would have been done two months ago. Were you surprised, though, that when you felt you had to leave Cabinet on principle, that no one else followed you out the door? It's a very hard thing to leave a Cabinet position. Um, I don't want to comment on anybody else's um, decision-making uh, processes, uh, but uh, what I did was difficult, uh, and uh, you know, I'm not sure whether others have uh, seriously contemplated it or not. I knew that I had to be able to live with myself uh, and, and be able to speak the truth and defend the government's approach on this, and I couldn't in good conscience do that, so I had no choice but to resign. You said in this interview with McLean's magazine that there were other revelations that you can't reveal because of cabinet confidence. Is the full story out now, or if you got a full waiver, would you have more to say? So what I was referring to is a few things. One was I knew that the former attorney general had additional information. Thankfully, there has been a process within the Justice Committee by which she was able to submit uh, some very important uh, paper documents uh, that are now out there, 43 pages of documents mm -hmm. that I encourage Canadians to read. Uh, there is more information uh, that I'm uh, uh, aware of conversations that I had, for example, that are relevant to the case. At this point, there's no, I don't have the freedom to share those things. They are matters of cabinet confidence. I 
I'm not going to make an issue of trying to find a way to share those details because I think there's enough information on the public record for Canadians to see what happened and judge for themselves. You and uh, Jody Wilson Raybould are, are, are close friends, and I know you share a, a lot of information on this thing. There's this story out, uh, sources are saying, I don't know who the sources are, that there's all these conditions that Jody Wilson Raybould uh, put on the Prime Minister that said she would have stayed in Cabinet had these deci these conditions been done. Get rid of Jerry Butts, get rid of the Clerk of the Privy Council, an official in the PMO, issue a public apology, and then most curiously of all, uh, ensure that the new Attorney General did not give SNC-Lavalin a deferred prosecution agreement. Does that ring true? to you? Well, there are a few things I will say about that. First of all, it disturbs me greatly that these sources are providing information about private conversations that may or may not have taken place between the former Attorney General and the Prime Minister, for example, uh, around certain times when the former Attorney General is not at liberty to share a perspective. And so I think people need to be extremely careful. I'm, of course, disturbed as to who these sources would be and, and what their motivations would be for, for sharing information that doesn't give the opportunity to organizations like yourself to, to check the validity and, and truth of those sources. Right. But the other point that you raised is this issue of some allegation that that there was a, a supposed condition um, around the what the uh, current AG would do. That's a preposterous allegation. Why would the former Attorney General have spent months ensuring that there was no political in interference in this very important criminal, criminal case and then turn around and do the opposite. So I think people ought to be extremely careful about uh, the validity of that information. What's this, I, I guess I'm getting curious as to the fact you said yesterday that not breaking the law is a pretty low bar for a government to say that, you know, it gives itself a passing grade on, its, on this scandal. What's it say to you that a caucus of 177 liberals uh, gave the Prime Minister a standing ovation when he announced he was tossing you out. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me a few things. Um, it's, it's hurtful. I think um, there is a lot of uh, peer pressure, I think, for mm -hmm. people to, uh, to join with their colleagues. I hope that this is going to continue to give us a conversation around what does it mean to be part of a caucus? Uh, people like to use the team analogy as if you know team loyalty is is of 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 the utmost importance, and we have to all think the same thing on every single issue. I'm not sure that that's what Canadians expect. I know my constituents in Markham Stovall expect me to represent them, and if sometimes their uh, feedback to me does not meet the uh, the proposed discussion that we're talking about at caucus, I have an obligation to, sh to share that honestly. And so uh, I think there needs to be more discussion about uh, what the role of team loyalty is versus uh, making sure above all we respect the truth. And that's where I, on this particular issue, felt like we were uh, not being uh, as, as frank as Canadians would like us to be as to what took place. And uh, I'm a loyal person. I believe very strongly in loyalty. But uh, there are few values that are of more importance in politics than the value of the truth. Right. And it's interesting you bring that up because caucus loyalty and the leaders all powerful to decide who's in that caucus and who not. Do you see that that's what needs to be changed, the power of the leader? It's way too centralized and way too controlling. Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, you commented about the, you know, the, the leader's decision, for instance, around expelling a caucus member, and that brings up another whole conversation, which we won't have time to get into today, that uh, MP Michael Chong has raised in the right. House on a point of privilege in terms of um, whether, in fact, that uh, meets the requirements of, of a law that was passed in 2015 around um, how parties should go about deciding whether caucus members are expelled. I don't want to sidetrack us in that regard. I think uh, that in my uh, relatively short experience in politics, I think there's work to be done in terms of trying to make sure that we provide safe spaces for people to respectfully disagree with one another, uh, particularly on issues that are not necessarily core 
uh, platform pieces. And uh, it can be hard. I can see it's hard for people to speak up and feel that it, it's safe to do so. You, you place a high priority on truth. You mentioned that earlier. Um, your view of what happened and Jody Wilson-Raywell's view of what happened and the prime minister seems at odds a bit. Is, is the prime minister lying? Is there a cover-up happening here? So I, I think you have seen perhaps that the story has evolved over time. So the initial response uh, from the Prime Minister the day that the story broke in the Globe and Mail was to deny that the allegations mm -hmm. were true. Since that time, there's been more information made available to the public. And I don't think any of it has actually demonstrated that those initial allegations were not true. In fact, it has validated <laughs> the, that, that those stories were there. The story then seems to have changed to uh, saying, well, it, you know, it, there was pressure, but it wasn't inappropriate pressure. Well, you know, who gets to decide what pressure is appropriate or inappropriate. And then the most worrisome thing of all is to say that, well, there may have been pressure, but it actually doesn't matter. It's not that important because there were other considerations. There are a few things that are more important to our democracy than upholding the rule of law and the independence of the justice system. We don't want to live in a country where if you happen to know a powerful politician or you donated enough to a political party, you can uh, find your way for an individual or or a corporation to be freed from pursuing a criminal trial. Politics and the justice system need to be entirely separate from one another. That is the, one of the, the fundamental tenets of our democracy, and we have to uphold it at all, all costs. So the attorney, I would follow that. You say you probably think the attorney general and justice minister should be a split portfolio. You know, uh, I hear people say that. I think it's still an, inter an interesting conversation, and obviously people are looking into that right now. Um, fundamentally, what it comes down to, whether the Attorney General is uh, shares the role of Minister of Justice or there's an independent Attorney General, it comes up to the integrity of the Attorney General. It's, it's one of the most important roles in our whole country to know that the Attorney General is a person of the highest ethical principle and integrity and that they understand that the decisions that they make cannot be contaminated by partisan or political considerations. I'm curious what you thought about the fact that last week Justin Trudeau seemed to talk like you're all welcome to stay in the, the caucus and run as liberals. And then this recording comes out of Jody Wilson-Raybould talking to Clerk of the Privy Council, uh, Michael Wernick, and suddenly everything seemed to pivot against you staying in caucus and Jody Wilson-Raybould. Was that recording a big mistake to do and to release? Well, I think uh, people that want to understand more about why the recording took place, I would encourage them to have a look at the documents that were tabled by the former Attorney General that give her reasoning um, as to why she had reached the point uh, for her own protection as well as her own documentation uh, to do that. What concerns me about this is that people have focused so much on the fact that that tape exists um, without thinking about what is that tape saying and what was taking place during that time and what did it then confirm about what had taken place over the number of months leading up to that. That's what Canadians need to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, in, a, in any ordinary circumstances, uh, as the former Attorney General has said, that would not necessarily be the appropriate thing to do, but these are not ordinary circumstances. This was uh, an attorney general who had been under tremendous pressure over a number of months, was in the place where um, she had reason to believe that her uh, uh, future in that role was being threatened mm -hmm. and found herself in a place where she had to get documentation of that. But her, it sounds to me like she thought the trust was broken right then or even before then. Yeah, as I say, I encourage people to read the really excellent documents to be able to get to uh, hear from herself. I want to bring a clip in from yesterday's uh, event, uh, The Daughters of the Vote. I, I thought that was quite a fascinating and probably poorly timed one from the Trudeau government's point of view. But here's, a, here's one of the uh, delegates that attended, 338 young women from across Canada. Here's what one of them had to say about Jody Wilson-Raybould in particular being uh, removed from uh, the caucus. My immediate reaction was I was really upset. I was um, overwhelmed. And it was kind of like, 
I got to meet her the day before, actually, on the Tuesday night. She came and I got to take a picture with her and just tell her thank you for everything you are doing. So to go from such a high of meeting her one day to seeing her kind of be kicked right out from that position, um, kind of made it feel like maybe we don't have a place, but from today and seeing how many supporters we have, I do belong here and we do have a place. I, I found that quite uh, riveting in a way, and I wondered, uh, you've met with them today, I believe you had some in your office. What's the message in the treatment that Jordi at Wilson-Raybould received in particular, but you as well? What's the general message to young women out there? Is there one? I was so inspired by those young women. As uh, you may have heard, I had the opportunity to hear many of them speak in the house, and their speeches were... Uh, incredibly impressive and then had the chance to meet some of them at a reception later and then some of them came and uh, provided drums and songs uh, to encourage uh, myself and my uh, colleague. Um, I think the message still is a message of hope from those young women. Uh, they uh, felt the uh, seriousness of some of the conversations that we're having right now in Ottawa. Uh, but I think they came away feeling that now more than ever, their voices are absolutely critical. And now more than ever, Canada needs young women of a whole range of ethnic and sociocultural and economic backgrounds to be able to come uh, to be a part of uh, Parliament, to be a part of the governing of this country um, so that their voices can be heard. And I think they went away feeling quite empowered and uh, realizing how much they're needed. Interesting. Well, we, we know the Prime Minister, a lot of his talk, uh, certainly in private and in public, now we know was about the political gain or vulnerability from SNC or from other actions. Do you think the Liberals are going to pay a price for having done this? Do you think that, that women are going to be more concerned about Justin Trudeau as a feminist? Well, I'm not good at uh, predicting the political future fortunes of any <laughs> particular party. It's, uh, it's not my area of expertise. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, this is, this is extremely unfortunate that all of this has happened. And I, I, I so wish that we could turn back the clock uh, several months um, and that people would have made different choices. Uh, having said that, this has raised some really important uh, conversations. I'm hearing from people, I'm getting thousands of messages, um, and what I'm hearing from people is, I never paid attention to politics before, I'm now listening, this is really interesting what's taken place, and they're also starting to think of things like the independence of the justice system, which we kind of took for granted before, and now people are saying, oh my gosh, that is actually really important, and I, I understand now that politicians shouldn't be messing in that. So um, what that will do to the political future of the country, I think any time that Canadians are engaged in understanding the importance of protecting our democracy is a good time. But not to get crass about political, political processes, but I've even heard your local executive in Stouffville uh, has resigned, some or all of them. There is going to be a political price here. Well, uh, I haven't got the specific details. I know that uh, a number of members of the executive of, of the riding association in my riding have either resigned or intend to resign as a result of this. They have been uh, deeply upset by what took place. Uh, and I, as I say, have heard from an incredible number of people in my riding and across the country who have been very supportive of, of, of uh, myself and wanted to express their, um, their thanks. Um, you know, we have all learned from this. I think that's pretty fair to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, Canadians will expect us all to uh, continue to represent them well and to uphold high standards. And in October, Canadians will get to decide who best will be able to speak for them in Ottawa. I'm going to press you on your future because I had the Green Party leader on the show yesterday and she goes... Oh, well, we'd love to have both of them come in, strong women on the Green Party ticket. The NDP is not uh, not uh, cool to that idea. The Provincial Liberal Party, I know, is probably making overtures for you to consider looking at the Ontario legislature. Where's, where's your next stop, Jane? 
I don't know yet. Um, I have loved being a member of parliament. I've loved being a cabinet minister. I feel like I was able to uh, do work that has helped many people, and it was a privilege to be able to do that work. I would like to think that there is a future for me in politics, but at this point, it's unclear uh, what that would look like. Uh, I think there are options out there. I'm going to spend the next few weeks talking to my family and talking to people in Markham Stouffville to get their advice. And uh, as soon as I have uh, any news, I'll let you know. You have no regrets about having entered the process? I have no regrets. Not, not through the whole scam. If you could turn back the clock, it wouldn't change anything? I have no regrets about any of the decisions that I've made in this process. Okay. And can you still respect the Prime Minister notwithstanding this? The Prime Minister is the leader of our country, and he deserves the respect of all Canadians. All right. Jane Philpott, it was a pleasure having you on. As always, thank you for coming in. Appreciate this. Thank you.